Hi there, welcome to another Prehistory Guys interview where we have the chance to introduce you to archaeologists and historians involved in groundbreaking work around the globe. Today we're talking with archaeologist Dr. Lee Clare, coordinator of research for Gebekli Tepe, one of the most enigmatic ancient sites in the world. Yeah, in 2015, Dr. Clare took on the position of research coordinator of the DFG long-term project at Gebekli Tepe, and in 2019 moved to the DAI's Istanbul department, where he is now acting consultant for prehistoric archaeology. Now, we got the impression, I think, didn't we, Rupert, that there's, how can we put this, um, quite a lot of misinformation uh, out there about uh, Gebekli a Tepe. A huge so, amount, yes. Yeah, and um, yeah, our knowledge wasn't that hot, so we thought we'd go straight to the source and uh, talk to the man who can give us the very latest on the excavations and current interpretations of what many people see as the oldest megalithic site in the world. Dr. Lee Clare, welcome to the show, and thanks so much for agreeing to join us. We're uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to this one. You. You're in Istanbul, aren't you? I'm in Istanbul. Yeah. What's the weather like over there? Oh, looking out the window, a, a bit blowy, um, but not as blowy as it has been the past couple of days. Or well, yesterday, in fact, was uh, a bit of a storm going on. But uh, I'm quite safe here in my little apartment. <laughs> in <my home> office. <laughs> <laughs> surviving over there. Well, listen, Lee, first things first, uh, we always like to ask people, what was it that brought you into archaeology in the first place? Mm. And particularly with you, and then how did all that eventually take you to uh, be involved with Gebekli Tepe? You know, it's quite quite a leap. Well, from, uh, it's, it's a long story, I suppose. I mean, I, I, think, I think the easiest answer, or the basic answer would be that uh, as a child, I was always interested in history. And uh, at the time, like most young boys, it was dinosaurs. And then uh, <laughs> it progressed from there. And I, I realised that humans were, were totally, well, much more interesting than, than dinosaurs at some point. And, and then... Uh, yeah, I mean, history um, was always something that I enjoyed doing at school. And then uh, after that, it sort of, I, I, I decided instead to do languages because I wanted to get out. I wanted to go somewhere else in, oh, in okay. the world. So I did German and, and, and French at university in London and uh, ended up in Cologne, where I stopped and did my archaeology studies there. So I was combining both my language and my getting out of, of the UK with the uh, added advantage of studying archaeology as well. It's, that's how it happens. And then Istanbul, that was part of the, I mean, I did my uh, master's and my uh, PhD in, in, in Cologne, in Cologne. And then uh, after completing my PhD, uh, I got a position with uh, Klaus Schmidt on the excavation project at Gebekli Tepe. Uh, right. Um, he unfortunately passed away, as you know, in 2014. Mm. And, and since then, I've been heading the uh, research project um, at Gebekli Tepe. So, you know, mm. these things sort of happen. Fantastic. Right place, right time, I guess. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, that, that's uh, brilliant. I mean, did, did you have any... Was it an ambition? Was it an ambition to get to Gebekli Tepe? Was it on your Not horizon? No, I mean, it, um, when I was doing my master's in, in Cologne, I was very much yeah. um, looking at uh, Central European Neolithic. Right. So the linear yeah. pottery, I did my master's on linear pottery, yeah. and I was quite uh, enamoured with that, and, and I was enjoying yeah. myself. But then uh, for the PhD, it sort of changed direction again, and I was uh, looking at climate change, the so-called 8.2 event, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and that sort of brought me into contact with mm. Turkey and ah. uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, the, the Near East. And then yeah. uh, this position came up with Klaus Schmidt, which I applied for, and lo and behold, uh, here I am. So it's, uh, wow. but uh, quite different, obviously, to the Neolithic that we have in in uh, Central Europe to that that we have here in in Turkey, especially in southeastern Turkey, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. uh, that's a that's a bit of background about uh, about Lee. I think uh, before we kick off, you know, about you know getting into the nitty gritty about uh, mm. Gebekli Tepe um, itself and the, and the recent developments in the archaeology there, but a bit of background about I don't know, Gebekli Tepe as a as a institution because yeah. quite a lot has been happening over the past years, twenty five years in, indeed. Yeah. You know, you've got places like Stonehenge and, and mm -hmm. Machu Picchu, you know, because of their global uh, reach. Yeah. Uh, there's an institutionalization that occurs. And I think there's a bit of a story that you can tell about uh, Gebekli Tepe. Yeah, I mean, regard. the site itself, I mean, if you think about other big archaeological sites, 
uh, especially classical ones, you know, that they, they, they have research going back over 100 years, you know, and of mm-hmm. course, with Gebekli Tepe, everything started back in the mid 1990s. So, you know, just over 25 years ago. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's been sort of a, 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 like a very quick development, uh, you could say, because of course, in 2018, we've got the UNESCO uh, status, the inscription. And uh, since then, things have taken off. But even before then, of course, it was very uh, yeah, present in the, in the media. Um, mm. You know, I think we'll probably go into the, the thing about the, the world's first temples, etc., a bit later on. But, yeah. um, you know, it's been a very uh, high speed sort of, you know, from this first discovery. The first discovery was actually in the 1960s uh, in the frame of a research or a survey project in the region by uh, uh, the Oriental Institute in Chicago and the University of Istanbul at the time. And after that, after the initial discovery, it was more or less, say, not forgotten, but it was, you know, published. And, but it wasn't until the mid 1990s that excavations actually started there. So um, you can actually say, you know, the rediscovery of Gebekli Tepe in the mid 1990s marks the beginning of this sort of present phase. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as I say, within that 25 years, um, we've gone from, you know, initial excavations to uh, a fully, uh, you know, developed UNESCO World Heritage Site. So a very fast process, in fact. Mm. I mean, uh, not least of which has been the development of the visitor centre. I have to admit, you know, in my imagination, uh, up until quite recently, uh, Gebekli Tepe was a, you know, was an archaeological site, you mm. know, exposed up in the the, the hills, remote from uh, from anywhere. But now you've got a full blown and uh, quite wonderful looking uh, visitor yeah, centre. I mean, that's that's uh, how it was. I mean, in fact, it was. I mean, the first excavation seasons, in fact, there was no excavation house. And, you know, Klaus Schmidt and his team were actually camping um, wow. at the site. And of course, the roads that now exist were not non existent, or they were just sort of simple mud paths. Yeah. Um, and of course, since then, you know, we've now got, the, as you said, the visitor centre, we have shuttle buses, we have um, wow. a shop, a ticket office, um, the main road, it's all well connected. And it's attracting uh, thousands of people every year. So, I mean, this is, uh, and of course, it has increased significantly since 2018 an inscription on UNESCO. That's obviously a, a part of that. But it's also, of course, uh, you know, being uh, advertised quite a, quite a bit. I mean, if you, if you fly into Istanbul Airport, um, even till quite recently, there was a big sort of one-to-one copy, I say copy, um, sort of a representation of, of, of uh, some of the pillars from Gebekli Tepe and, and actually reconstructed or built um, at the, uh, I think it was at the... Uh, um, terminal, the international terminal at, at yeah. uh, the new Istanbul airport. So, I mean, there's a lot of publicity out there as well. Um, and you only have to go do an internet search to, to find all sorts of uh, things about the site, some of which are <laughs> a bit hair raising. But, um, <laughs> you know, this is part of the parcel. <laughs> well, it, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because at most internationally important sites, all, all the archaeology has been completed, but your work at Quebecly Tefe is just, it's ongoing with new discoveries being made all the time. So how do you reconcile, the, the you know, the conflicts between carrying on with excavations whilst you've got hordes of tourists uh, coming to visit throughout the year? Yeah, I mean, um, obviously it's not always that easy. I mean, it depends on the tourists, of course. Um, you may re- may know we have uh, a new or two new um, uh, big protective shelters which were constructed at the site mm. uh, as part of the uh, application for UNESCO uh, World Heritage. That was all part of that uh, process. Oh, okay. And one of those, the main one, of course, where the, the main uh, sort of site is, the main excavation area, um, the public can actually sort of walk around the whole excavation area and sort of look in, look over our shoulders, as it were, at the work we're doing. And of course, you know, everyone wants to sort of meet and greet uh, the archaeologists. So it does get a little bit sort of, you know, on, on some days, you know, uh, but uh, we try and, uh, you know, uh, keep them informed and, and be as nice as we can, even if we are in a bit of a rush. Um, but of course, you do get some guests sort of um, asking us politely to move out of the way because they want to take a photo where I do sort of <laughs> get a little bit, uh, you know, but uh, we hope. But I think the, the best thing is that we do have positive feedback on that. I think it's very good, yeah. um, uh, you know, for, for the public to see us at work, this sort of public yeah. public yeah. archaeology, um, that point. they feel, you know, that they're seeing uh, state-of-the-art excavations and what's going on at the site, and to be involved mm. in that. And I think that's part of the experience they have when they visit us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit, a bit of trivia. There was a, a Turkish television series, or was, um, called, uh, what, what is it? Uh, 
uh, Atiai. Atiai. Uh, mm. Ati- and uh, that's caused a bit of a... Yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've watched the series as well. I mean, I, I found it quite amusing. Um, but of course, there's a lot of fiction in there. And there's a lot of stuff in there that just doesn't, you know, the, the site was used for filming. Um, yeah. But we do get then uh, tourists coming up or, and visitors asking, you know, where is this scene? Where was it set? Where's the cave? Where's this? Where's that? And I'm like, well, sorry, you know, this, this doesn't exist. There's no secret tunnel linking us to Nemwood or whatever. It's, it's all um, pretty <laughs> unspectacular in that, in that sense. It's not particularly Hollywood um, but yeah, of course yeah. it's a very impressive site uh, in archaeological terms as well yeah, yeah. People like uh, sort of uh, Highlander made the Clava Cairns uh, <laughs> famous yeah. that's true yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway let's get on to a bit more uh, specific stuff um, I think what is missing you know was certainly missing from my perception I think uh, missing from a lot of people's perception is the broader context that uh, Gebekli Tepe sits in not only in space, but also in in time. Could you, uh, I know it's a tall order, but uh, give a bit of a background, a bit of, you know, the, the story, the context in which Gebekli Tepe mm. sits in terms of, you know, the Tigris, Euphrates, the Fertile Crescent, and what was going on during uh, this uh, period you know yeah we well, call it the I, I, pre-pottery I, yeah. neolithic and all that kind of thing of course that is a tall order <laughs> yeah well and the fact that it's not alone in, that, uh, in, I, I, I yeah. my best. well yeah. um let's put it quite simply i mean this whole process of neolithization it's something that evolved over a very long period of time it didn't mm-hmm. sort of uh, it's not this sort of revolution that you often hear about that it happened more or less overnight it's a yeah. long drawn out process reaching right back into the into the paleolithic and leading you know 1000 2000 3000 years until we actually have this sort of fully evolved neolithic sort of communities uh, which then sort of uh, dispersed as it were mm-hmm. um uh, and of course, Gobekli Tepe has often been seen uh, as the smoking gun of this process, you know, that, that mm. Gobekli Tepe was that trigger that caused this. And of course, that's quite difficult to uh, prove. Or it's not, it's not facts, you know, this is because, of course, sedentarism, sedentarism you know, people becoming, staying in one place, um, cultivating wild crops, Etc. That's something that started right back in the Epipaleolithic, you know, the end of the Paleolithic, mm. and uh, something you know which wasn't a, a linear development, but it was more like you know up and down, you know. Um, and we even see that still at the time of Gobekli Tepe, that there were some sites that had domesticated animals and, and crops, and others that didn't. And of course, mm. this whole process is just not as simple as perhaps the language or the terminology makes it out to be. So a very long drawn process, drawn out process. Yeah. And of course, Gobekli Tepe sits more or less at a very key moment in that process. You know, at the beginning of the Holocene, climate amelioration, um, coming out of the Younger Dryas. And of course, um, you know, for this reason, and especially with the connection to religion and the first temples that I've just mentioned, um, it brought about a bit of a, um, it wasn't a controversy, but it was, it was certainly something that people looked at when it happened, especially academics saying, hang on a minute, and, and Klaus Schmidt, uh, looking back at, back at work by Corvin, for example, saying, you know, uh, it wasn't, you know, religion came first, and it actually triggered uh, the domestication. For example, the building of these buildings, these monumental buildings, these temples, um, yeah. uh, made people become uh, more reliant on, on supply of, of, of food, of victuals. And uh, for this reason, it led to domestication. So the, instead of, you know, the, the more or less religion triggered domestication. Of course, that's mm-hmm. a big sort of hypothesis. And um, uh, that's something we've been looking at in more detail just recently. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, to put it in a nutshell, of course, a long drawn out process, Gebekli Tepe at a very crucial stage in this process, but not the trigger um, that some people or, or, or it's often made out to be. Yeah, yeah. Because I find it inter- very fascinating, um, this idea of sedentism, you know, of being settled and at the same time um, existing, uh, persisting uh, within a kind of hunter-gatherer um, method of, of subsistence. Um, I, and the fact that you said that it's uh, up and down, it's not clear-cut, um, but you wonder how... Uh, you know, large settlements like this 
can subsist, you know, with that mechanism. Where are they going out to? To how far are they reaching out to uh, to hunt? And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, how far are they reaching mean- out? does not necessarily mean that you're totally sedentary. You are still very mobile in, in, the, in the landscape, of course, for hunting right. purposes, for gathering purposes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a bit of a, a misconception when you say sedentary. Sedentary doesn't mean 100% sedentary, but of course there's a very high level of mobility in there. Well, do you think there's something particular about the area then that uh, had a sedentism um, arise? Um, something particular in the characteristics of the landscape, the climate at the time, or uh, what what have you, mm. uh, that uh, had sedentism take hold? Um, I mean, with sedentism, I mean, obviously, I think the um, the economy plays a very big part in, in in how you in how mobile you are, and of yeah. course, if you are relying on 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 uh, stands of, of, of wild crops. Um, or, or on certain animals, um, uh, then perhaps you do become more sedentary in that respect to, to keep hold of those uh, resources. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, I think with, with the, looking at Gobekli Tepe, uh, I think obviously the climate amelioration, amelioration at the beginning of the Holocene uh, did cause reforestation. It did bring uh, new species um, and of course you, ha- you have to think I mean the main uh, animal they were hunting there was gazelle and of course the gazelle oh, right. were migrating and you know they're following the migratory paths of these animals and of course you know um, that's something we have to consider as well so I think the resources and the, the, the economy are certainly very big uh, uh, factors in, in uh, becoming sedentary um, uh, and for that reason, I mean, it, it can happen. I mean, of course, even in the Upper Paleolithic in, in Central Europe, we have a sort of sedent- sedentism um, in, okay. in, at Gunnersdorf in, in, in Central you know, Europe. It's, it's, um, it can happen. I mean, there are certainly hunter-gatherer societies which can be sedentary or more or less sedentary, of course, with, with varying degrees of, of uh, mobility. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think obviously the, the, nat- the natural surroundings, the landscape, um, the resources are an inc- important factor in that. Um, the social aspect, of course, is another thing. I mean, this is something. And of course, when you start building large structures like at Gebekli Tepe, it would imply that there is a certain degree of connection uh, to a landscape and to staying within that landscape, um, mm. marking boundaries, etc. So a rising territoriality. Um, so I haven't really got an answer to your question, but I can see, you know, from what I know in, in the region as, you know, as markers for, for that, indicators. No, but I mean I, that's a it's fantastic because there were several points came up within that that I hadn't realised uh, before. Um, you know, hunting of the gazelle, of course, it makes sense now. But <laughs> well, actually, interesting enough, there are actually hunting traps, um, so-called kites, uh, yes. in the vicinity ah. of, of Gobekli Tepe and the other Tepe sites in the region, yeah. which uh, you perhaps already know from other parts of the, of the Near East. But actually, we do have them in in the Shanawafa region in southeastern Turkey, although yes. the dating hasn't been confirmed yet, but it would appear that they, well, they might be um, uh, contemporary with, uh, with these T-pillar uh, early Neolithic sites. Right. Okay. Yeah, it is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Well, well, many of the discoveries that you've been making over the last few years have completely overturned some of the earlier assumptions. I mean, you're just mentioning some there. But so, I mean, for example, I mean, just to, you know, toss out a list of these questionable things that have arisen over the years. Yeah. So there's there's the zero point in time idea that Gobekli Tepe was the yeah. origin of everything. Um, uh, it, it was said that there were, originally it was said that there were no domestic buildings, that people couldn't live there because there was no water, uh, that it was deliberately backfilled and covered over and that there was evidence of feasting there but that, that's all, all these things have been disproved in one way or another haven't they so um, so so we're in this situation of what do we actually know now yeah. if that's not just an enormous mm. question to lob at you in that yeah. way I, mean, I wouldn't say all these points have been disproved i think we we've been looking again at the evidence that we've had from earlier excavations and in the course of the uh, construction of these new protective shelters at the site, we've been doing, um, we did uh, a number of uh, deep soundings um, right through, of course, you can't sort of um, sort of anchor your big shelter without actually drilling into the into the underlying bedrock. And sure. of course, you cannot drill through archaeology. So in the course of the past, actually, Klaus Schmidt started these works uh, quite a few years back. 
Mm -hmm. And we continued them after he passed away, uh, up to the construction of these uh, shelters. And it involved actually in small areas removing all of the, the deposits, archaeological deposits from these soundings. And in the course of which we got glimpses into lower parts or the lowest levels of, of, the, of the mound, of the artificial mound. Uh, the domestic or the, the archaeological accumulations and deposits. And it was here that we actually did find, for the first time, very good evidence for domestic activity. And of course, previously to this, there had been some speculation or doubt, as it were, that, 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 that there was not a domestic, uh, a, a clear domestic a component to the site, that it was mainly a, a ritual site, um, a, a sacred site uh, that was visited by groups in the area at certain times of the year. Now, these, this new evidence that we've got now from these deep soundings, I mean, we have got very good um, uh, features of, of uh, dwellings, um, of activity zones, of uh, flint napping, um, hearths. I mean, the thing was, there was never a clear fireplace or a hearth discovered, really, uh, until, mm -hmm. until these uh, deep soundings. Um, mm -hmm. And this was one of the reasons that Klaus Schmidt always said, that it appears that this site was actually more of a ritual site than a domestic site. And you mentioned also the water. I mean, the water, he was also aware that there are systems um, in the surrounding landscape on the plateau, um, because there's no, within the direct vicinity of the site, there's no flowing water, there's no... Um, a river, uh, the nearest being about you know, two or so kilometers, two or three kilometers away, um, mm -hmm. uh, down the slope. Um, so um, these systems were, were, and there were also sort of uh, channels carved into the plateau, actually diverting or draining the, the runoff, the water, rainwater runoff into these systems and collecting the water. Um, and of course, in the early Holocene, um, there was increased, uh, more precipitation, I think, than today. It would have been, a, you know, uh, okay. wetter than, than today. And of course, that would have. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, speak also in favour of this water harvesting. Um, but anyway, we're coming off the, tra off, off, off the track of the question now. But um, there's, there's this, of course, there's, um, uh, and uh, we also have a, a burial. Uh, for a long time, burials was, were, were, were looked for but were never found. And of course, burials are also uh, an indication that people are, are, are staying in one place and burying their, their, uh, their dead there. Uh, especially mm -hmm. in the, in the, in the pre-pottery Neolithic, it's quite common that you have sub-floor burials. So more or less, they open up the, your cellar when, you're, when your relative dies. Um, then you open up the floor of the, of, the, of the room and you stick this person in. So, you know, granny passes away and you go down to the, uh, you know, down there and open up a hole and, and put her in and she's with you for eternity um, which I find a quite <laughs> sounds a bit weird but it's quite a nice uh, thought in a way um, yeah. so we've had a burial come out during the course of these uh, soundings which was very nice it, it was between two PPNB floors in a, in a PPNB mm -hmm. building which is also an indication that these buildings were, were domestic in a way um, there are large numbers of grinding stones the, the lithics has now been looked at again uh, or large-scale uh, analyses of lithics within the frame of a PhD dissertation, or two, in fact, ongoing, um, which are also showing that the, the lithics and the, 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 the flint tools at uh, the site are very clearly domestic in, in function. So a very typical domestic sort of uh, repertoire of tools. So um, this all speaks in favour of, of people actually living uh, at the site. And I think in the PPNA, in the, in the yeah. earliest part of the site, so, I mean, just go back to chronology, I mean, the site begins... P PPNA you know, is pre-pottery pre -pottery pre -pottery A, which starts uh, around A, the mid-10th yeah. millennium BC, so about 9,500, yep. 600 BC, and goes to about 8,700 BC. And then we have the early PPNB, which starts at 8,700 BC to about 8,200 BC. And I think in the PPNA, so in you know, the outgoing 10th millennium, earliest, early 9th millennium BC, we're seeing at least uh, some, uh, at least domestic buildings at the site, whether they were totally sedentary at this time, it's hard to say, mm. you know, okay. analyses are ongoing, but I think it's, it's, it's quite a good chance of that. But by the PPNB, by the early PPNB, by about the mid-9th millennium BC, I think we're looking at quite a significant uh, settlement, in fact, um, mm. with, you know, uh, rectangular buildings. Uh, one of the new or one of the um, new things of the early PPNB compared to the PPNA is that in the PPNA you have more or less round buildings, and in the PPNB uh, they invent the corner and, and uh, buildings become <laughs> rectangular, slowly, but not yeah. Yeah. solely rectangular, you have round buildings as well. But... Um, 
uh, and then we have these rectangular buildings with subterranean subfloor burials, um, uh, and everything points to this domestic activity. So okay. we're moving away from this sort of previous paradigm of the site being um, a, a ritual site, a purely ritual site, to one with a, a domestic component, a clear domestic component, which is focused mm -hmm. on these special buildings. Okay. Um, so that's that, in a, you know, as I would uh, sort of... In many ways, I think um, people might perceive this conversation as kind of back to front because we've uh, <laughs> sort of landed, you know, in the in the domestic area of Gebekli Tepe and, you know, not talked up front about everybody's image of Gebekli Tepe, and that is the T-pillars in the uh, main buildings. Um, uh, call them you know, people... This is this is the springboard for the idea of Gebekli Tepe as a as a temple. Mm. Uh, as uh, point zero, it's this monumental aspect uh, of the main buildings. How many? Say a bit about how many there are, and and you know their concentration in the middle yeah. and the, the the time span that. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, this zero point in time business. I mean, this is something that the site. This is the um, official title of the site, as it were, in the media. Um, yes. And if you go to the visitor centre, that's what it says there. And it's always also been referred to as Ground Zero, which I find a bit. Ominous. But as as I you know explained, I mean, it's not a zero point in time really. I mean, you know, this whole development. There were special buildings before Gebekli Tepe. At, you know. PPNA sites and epipaleolithic sites. I mean, this is something that isn't new. But what is new at Gebekli Tepe is this monumentality, the, the, the size of it. The, the fact is, it's, it's these big T pillars um, up to five and a half meters in height. Um, the uh, engraved, or the, the say the, the, the reliefs and the the um, uh, high reliefs, low reliefs. The, the engravings and, and the symbolism that we have at the site. And mm. uh, this is actually the reason why it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's the fact that we have this wonderful site um, with these, this breathtaking architecture, which is really quite new, um, what was new at the time. Of course, we have further sites now. Sure. Um, uh, so that, that's uh, an important point. But where were we going with this? Um, the question was, sorry. Uh, yes, just, I mean, so, <laughs> but we, we've got what? Uh, buildings, how many are there? Eight. Oh, yeah. Eight. Yeah, uh, we have quite a few of these so-called special buildings. Um, uh, several, in fact, uh, we've labelled them alphabetically. This is something that Klaus Schmidt began um, with uh, building A um, at the beginning, and uh, we're now up to building H. This is the last building that was discovered. Uh, I don't know, just before Klaus uh, passed away, or a few years before that. Um, it's in the northwestern part of the site, but uh, yeah, these buildings. Um, We'll come to the temple description in a minute. I'll just describe, first of all, these buildings. I mean, they're obviously very special. They're special buildings. I refer to them as special buildings or um, structures to get away from this temple business. Um, they're characterized more or less by a round oval shape. Um, and in the walls of these, uh, or inset into the walls of this, these buildings are a dozen or so pillars. It varies in number, um, which are up to about three and a half meters in height. And mm -hmm. towards the middle of the buildings, free stand, there are two freestanding pillars of up to five and a half metres in, in height. Now, I think the best example is then building D, which is um, not totally excavated, but it's getting there. Um, we did some more work on that this year and, and uh, uncovered a bit of the area in the centre that hadn't been uncovered previously. And, you know, they have a diameter, you know, 10, 12, up to 20, 25, 30 metres. Uh, varies, of course, from building to building. Each building should obviously be seen individually. Um, the carvings on the pillars are very much oriented towards like the, the, a lot of wild animals. Obviously, you wouldn't expect domestic, with no domesticated animals, they're all wild animals. Um, very often, uh, things like foxes, snakes, aurochs, wild boar, uh, these are all vultures. These are all very common motifs um, on, on, the, uh, on these pillars. So um, if we go into the interpretation, now I would move away, as I said, from this sort of temple interpretation or this term temple. For me, it's it just sort of, it's, it's too tight. It's, it's, it's not giving us the, the possibility of exploring other functions of these buildings, in fact. Um, because, of course, if you say temple, uh, the first thing you think of is a church or a synagogue or a mosque. And we're sort of imposing our own sort of modern concept of temple onto these buildings. And I think yeah. it's more than that. I think we have to, do, you know, we can't just say that, uh, you know, back in you know, 10,000 years ago, people were going to one particular building to practice rituals and to worship. 
I'm not questioning the fact that there was a religion. I'm not questioning, questioning the fact that there were rituals. Um, but I think to narrow it down uh, to such a very fine sort of interpretation uh, of these buildings by using this term is, is limiting us uh, so yeah. much. And I think uh, the buildings deserve much more discussion as to their actual functions. The other conceptual aspect that we see in the, in the monumentalism there, we see photographs and the T structures uh, open to the skies, you know, and, and, and occurring as freestanding. And of course, the connection is immediately made to places like uh, Stonehenge. Mm. And I think that is probably one of the big mistakes. Yeah, I mean, you just said that the the, the surrounding T pillars are set into the walls. They're, they're not necessarily freestanding uh, items at all in the yeah. same way that uh, exactly. I mean, uh, yeah. with regarding sort of uh, regarding sort of comparisons with other sites like Stonehenge, like Malta, mm -hmm. etc. I mean, there's a big chronological gap uh, between them sure. and a geographical yeah. gap between them. That oh. A lot of people, yeah. um, I don't know, <laughs> perhaps uh, ignore, but of course we can't do that. And, um, you know, these, I, I've got my little tea pillar here, my little prop. Oh, right. I mean, um, uh, I think everyone's aware that uh, these T-shaped pillars are more than just uh, for holding up the roof. Um, and they were not open to the elements, at least not the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we have to imagine that these buildings were long-lived buildings, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, they had mm -hmm. many different phases. They were recycling the material used in the buildings. So what we're actually seeing, the excavation trenches, when you look into them, you're not seeing the, the building as it was at the time, but you're seeing all those different phases uncovered, um, which would yeah. not have been visible originally at the time when Gebekli Tepe was obviously in use. Um, now, uh, these buildings, uh, our recent um, sort of excavations and research has shown, we have got new radiocarbon data, for example, um, have shown that these buildings were actually in use for perhaps even up to several centuries. So, and of course, there's a lot of things that can be moved and replaced and, and um, chipped away um, over that time. So it's, it's very difficult to say how a building actually looked, for example, in the earliest of its phases. Um, mm -hmm. easier is of course how it looked in its latest phase um, so these are all things we have to take into con consideration so not only has the um, our understanding of the buildings changed because of this new chronology but of course also the the stratigraphy of the site needs to be reassessed and of course now mm -hmm. we're seeing whereas Klaus Schmidt previously said there was first the PPNA um, with the round buildings and the monumental buildings and then in the PPNB the rectangular buildings no these PPNA buildings actually l continued in their later phases into the PPNB, and they were still being uh, upkept and um, used even in this mm. time. So uh, and it, rebuilt uh, and rebuilt internally. Um, yeah. Pillars replaced or dragged yeah. from one place to another and reused, turned around. You know, for example, in Building A, there's a T pillar, a so-called central T pillar, which appears to be facing the wrong way. Um, so th we have to think of things like earthquakes, etc., that may have happened that caused damage that had to be repaired. Okay. Um, so there are very many things that you know were happening to these. These buildings were were evolving the whole time, and they were never actually mm -hmm. finished. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something we must consider uh, very closely when we're, we're thinking about interpretation. Am I right in thinking that um, there are smaller T pillars in some of the smaller uh, rooms? That's the only way, of, you know, uh, smaller buildings are more sort of um, buildings that could have been interpreted as more domestic in, in nature. Um, I, I think uh, what we're seeing here, and this is quite quite interesting. I mean, uh, we have these PPNA uh, round buildings, the big main monumental buildings with these large yeah. T pillars, and then in the PPNB, in the domestic, in the in the, in the smaller buildings, which are now rectangular, which now I think were more or less domestic, um, yeah. we see them as well. And of course, they're much smaller. Um, and I think what we're seeing here, I mean. I should also add that these T pillars were probably used for sort of um, architectural purposes for supporting a roof. Um, yeah. the, the, the big buildings were also probably roofed over with entrance through the roof through so-called portal stones that you went through down in, you know, in a ladder. Uh, and this also applied to the later rectangular PPNB buildings. We have good evidence that, you know, they were mainly entered through the roof and not through the ground level. And we don't have very much evidence for doors. So, or, you know, um, doors on the surface. Um, so, and I think, you know, what we're seeing here, 
And I think we see this a lot later on in later Neolithic at sites like Chateauhuyuk, is we're seeing this move, move of the ritual component from the big monumental buildings into the domestic buildings. So um, okay. as you probably know, I mean, at the end of Gebekli Tepe, these big monumental buildings disappear. We don't have them anywhere else. That's it. They're over. And a lot of the domestic, uh, a lot of the ritual activity is actually taking place within the domestic buildings. And I think we're seeing this shift already at Gebekli Tepe in these early PPNB buildings where they're actually incorporating these t pillars into the domestic architecture yeah so we we know that the upright pillars uh represent human forms because they've got arms carved down the side well, not so, all of them but yeah uh, but so what what is the rationale uh, that uh you know clearly they had the artistic skills to carve really quite sophisticated uh, representations of animals or whatever what is the thinking behind why uh, why do they just have block you know these T-shaped pillars? Why do they not have heads? What's well, the thinking quite around that? The answer is they didn't want them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they didn't want them. They could do them, but they didn't want them. And we have wonderful examples of, of um, sort of if you think of the uh, so-called Shannur for man or uh, from that was found in in building work at uh, in in the centre of Shannur for. Uh, which is the main city in the area. Um, I mean, this is from the PPNB, and it is, it's wonderful facial facial features. And from other sites now where excavations are taking place, for example, at Callahan Tepe, we have wonderful depictions of the human face. So, yeah, they could do it, but they okay. obviously didn't want to. And, mm. of course, the question is, why didn't they want to? Now, obviously, um, now our thinking at the moment as to the identities of these T-pillars, because each one, I think, would have... Um, been identifiable to the people at the time. Um, they either represented individuals or groups of individuals where a face was not, you know, it didn't make sense to actually portray an actual face. Um, or they were mythological in a way that they, it's hard for us to actually pinpoint it, but it wasn't mm -hmm. wanted. Um, but I think the most important thing is, is the other, the reliefs that are on these pillars. For example, on this one here, this is one of the pillars from the central um, uh, part of, or the free sunning pillars in, in building D. Um, you can see here the arm coming down and the, the elbow and here's a belt mm -hmm. and on the front here mm -hmm. you've got the belt buckle, the loincloth, uh, a, a necklace going on here. Um, and this one under its arm is actually carrying a fox. So what we're seeing here is a narrative. They're actually telling us these are the people that were using these buildings actively knew who was being represented by these tea pillars. Um, it's very much, I've given this example before in, in some talks of mine, and I quite like it. It's, you know, if you think of our, our sort of nursery sort of, you know, fairy tales, like, I don't know, Little Red Riding Hood and the fox, if we went to a pillar and we saw a little girl with a red cape and a wolf, a uh, wolf, sorry, then we'd know that's Little Red Riding Hood. We'd associate that story, that narrative with our culture, as it were. And I think there was no sure. difference to, to the people at the time. They knew exactly who was being depicted and represented by these uh, pillars. And there was no need to, to have a, a face on, on these things. Um, that would be my answer to that question. Um, and I think this whole narrative thing is extremely interesting. I mean, if you look at the different, I mean, this was a good example with the, with the guy carrying the fox. Um, you have others where we have different uh, sort of, uh, we have depictions of the wild boar, uh, which uh, is combined with perhaps the snake or, you know, or the, the certain birds, vultures, etc. I mean, uh, obviously, these are narratives, these are stories that the people knew. They're not just um, pictures of the animals they were seeing every day in, in, in nature or every other day. I don't know how often they saw these animals. But, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're telling a narrative in that combination. And I think these combinations are important to look at in order to get a sort of an insight into what's going on in the minds of, of these people. And I think uh, this is what actually makes Gebekli Tepe so special, is what we're seeing here is this sort of, we're getting a glimpse into the worldview of these people that were living 10,000, 11,000 years ago. And these were the, the stories, the narratives, the myths which were important to them, which were so important yeah. that they carved them on stone and actually put them up in these uh, magnificent buildings. That's a lovely perspective. It yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, it, yeah, Thank indeed. you. T tell me, the, there's one of the um, you know pillars of the, uh, if that's not too much of a pun, sorry, of the Gobekli <laughs> uh, Tepe as as a temple, as um, a ritual site that people kept coming back to, uh, was the idea that it had been backfilled uh, in one great uh, sort of end end of cycle uh, feasting 
event uh, where, where the, the thing was decommissioned. Um, but recent excavations yeah. have uh, put a bit of a damper on that idea. I yeah, guess. I mean, recent research looking at these uh, special buildings has, uh, you know, given us a wealth of new information. Um, we've not only been looking at the earlier recordings from the earlier excavations, but doing our own analyses and research, building archaeological research, radiocarbon dates, etc., uh, of these uh, monuments. Uh, and, you know, we can now firmly say that they were multi-phase. We have you know, a very long chronology of these buildings, uh, perhaps up to several centuries. Um, and it was always, I say always, but it was, it was a, a focus of earlier works, uh, to emphasise that these buildings were richly buried after the end of their use lives. Um, and we're now seeing evidence for other possible interpretations. Um, uh, certainly, we cannot rule out that the buildings weren't, to a certain extent, intentionally backfilled. But whether that happened in a ritual context is difficult, difficult to say. Uh, what we're seeing more at the moment is evidence for uh, pressure from the surrounding slopes because these buildings were actually situated, located, or are still in a bit of a hollow, uh, surrounded by then uh, flanked on three sides by these by these rectangular buildings, uh, higher lying on the slopes. And of course, we have the problem with with gravity and the, the fact we have it even now in our excavation trenches that there's a lot of pressure on on these slopes. Uh, and mm. in the past, um, there were probably slope slides, which led to the inundation of these buildings by uh, structures on the, on the surrounding slopes. So this is one of the uh, new uh, sort of uh, hypotheses that's coming out of our new work. Um, but of course, we can't just say it was this, it was that. Each building has to be looked at, you know, individually. Um, but at least for building D and probably for building C, there is very good evidence that there was inundation from slope slides. And there was actually repair going on to the, to the special buildings as an answer to this sort of pressure um, that was uh, emanating from the slopes. Um, and none more so than the actual architecture itself. Uh, the fact that these buildings, uh, the different phases of the buildings, then they got smaller, increasingly smaller over time. And one, the new building was always built inside the old building. That's why you have this sort of um, Russian doll sort of uh, situation going on where, you know, the, the outer or the larger building was the older phase. They built within that one and then they built within that one. And that's also an answer perhaps to the sort of coming to terms or at least mitigating the slope pressure that's coming from, from um, the, the, the surrounding uh, slope. That's yeah. astonishing. And do you have any sense of a timeline for, or a chronology for, yeah. you know, how frequently did they uh, did they do a rebuild uh, in in the Russian doll sense? Yeah, I, I think you know this is something we're working on now. We have uh, radiocarbon data, um, but we don't have radiocarbon data from all of the phases. Um, and I think until we have more data we can't actually go into the actual precise sort of chronology. And even then it's mm. difficult because, of course, you know, we have to have good, reliable uh, dates. Um, yeah. And uh, the preservation uh, of botanical remains is, is not so good at the site. I mean, we're lucky enough to have uh, you know, bits of charcoal that we can actually date. But, of course, charcoal, you always have the problem of old wood, et cetera, et cetera. There's yeah. a bit of an mm. but always a bit of a question mark with regards to that. And, of course, also the added uh, problem that a lot of the charcoals at the site have been mixed up and, you know, when they're making the mortar, perhaps you know, a bit of this and the other, it all gets mixed in. Um, so there's a lot of movement there. But the trend that we're seeing in the radiocarbon data, even though they are made on charcoal, is that we have a clear longevity of these special buildings from the PPNA period in to the PPMB. And most of these data are actually coming from the early PPNB. So the last phases of these buildings was definitely contemporary or contemporaneous with rectangular structures on the side of the slopes. So, um, and of course, the the contents, the what we actually excavate from these special buildings to actually you know, unearth them, um, it's just lots of rubble, it's animal bone, lots of animal bone, lots of flint tools. And all of this was probably coming from... Um, you know uh, the, the the structures on the on the mound uh, that slipped down. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, a bit of the occasional bit of human bone could be disturbed burials or skull caches, that sort of thing. We have a lot of skull fragments yeah, yeah. coming, or uh, well, say a lot, some. So, skull. is it true that you know some of that debris that had been coming down, uh, animal bone in particular, that had been previously interpreted as the remains of uh, a feasting yeah. event? 
Oh, That's right. right. Yeah. I mean, previously um, it was interpreted that these these ritual burial processes were accompanied by big feasts where people got together uh, for the manpower, woman power, um, and uh, to, to actually fill up these these buildings. Um, mm-hmm. But if you imagine that they were also within a settlement, it's very difficult to get that material to them in the first place if they're sort mm-hmm. of a, point, a central part of the settlement. Um, and I, I think the best sort of idea we've heard so or we've had so far is that this animal bone is actually coming from from refugees. Refuge pits, refuse pits yeah. um, that have been sort of disturbed and, and have slipped down yeah, yeah. Uh, the slope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just a, a side thing. Um, am I right in thinking you had a, l- a little bit of a, a, a revelation because some dating became available from uh, human bone that had been found in one of the cisterns? Um, yeah, uh, it wasn't actually up, dated. Up, up the but, hill, is that yeah, right? I mean, this was yeah. regarding the, the, um, the cisterns about the water. Um, yeah. uh, harvesting, as you might call it, rainwater harvesting. Um, mm. We were never sure whether this was actually contemporaneous with the actual archaeological site, because of course there's a lot of activity going on. It up had there. gone missing. That was the, the 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 bone had been discovered in the nineties. And then gone. Yeah, I think it was the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, what hap- yeah. What happened yeah. was a colleague was looking for botanical remains and went into one of these cisterns. Um, yeah. And ca- uh, you know, instead of getting his botanical remains, there were uh, lots of bones, uh, which turned out to, which then went back to Berlin, <laughs> and which we recently had analysed and looked at. And it turns out that these bones were actually human bones, and they were probably actually, and now they show scratch marks, very typical for the PPN period, for the, the treatment of bones uh, in a secondary yeah. sort of burial context. Context. And it, it turns out that there are numerous individuals, the long bones of numerous individuals interred in this uh, cistern, uh, which would then give us a, a date, really, that these cisterns were used in the PPN for a secondary burial. So they must be at least PPN in date, which is uh, fantastic for us because then we have the proof now that they actually were harvesting the water uh, in the PPN uh, period. Yeah, brilliant. We did mention it before, and that is the lithics, but I don't think people quite appreciate how much stonework that you've... Oh. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I've I mean, our, you, yes. our, our poor guys looking at the uh, lithics, they've got a bit of a job in front of them, but they... <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. Our depots are full, I think 90% more uh, is, is lithics, and even the site, I mean, um, compared to a, a, a normal, I say normal site in, in, in other areas, you know, you, you you get very excited if you find an arrowhead. Uh, you walk yeah. around there, and it's just like you know, you see a, a whole PhD on the on the floor in front of you because it's, it's <laughs> lying, lying around everywhere. Um, a great deal of lithics just on the surface, um, but of course, what's important for us is to have the context, and of course, the context. Uh, without the context, we can't actually, you know, the thing is with the lithics is giving some very interesting insights because it's showing us. For example, in these monumental buildings, the lithics discovered from or retrieved from, from these excavations is actually a mixed PPNA, PPNB inventory, which would also confirm that a lot of the stuff filling up these buildings wasn't actually there until the PPNB. So it's actually also dating the, 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 the process, or at least uh, it wasn't any earlier than the PPNB yeah. that these uh, buildings yeah. became uh, yeah, filled or inundated. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Astonishing, astonishing. Well, I'm very conscious of time romping on, but uh, I do have <laughs> do have to ask you: How mm. much more do you think there may still be to uncover at oh, Gebekli Tepe? Yeah, I mean. Um, uh, Obviously, we're continuing our, our excavations now. We're still focusing on areas that have already been excavated uh, by Klaus Schmidt, for example. This year, uh, 2021, we were working to the north of Building D, so the northern part of the main excavation area, and to the east of it, um, where we we're looking at th- these PPMB rectangular buildings, uh, some of which have been sort of partially excavated by Klaus Schmidt back in the 2010s. Uh, nine, ten, um, and carried on work there, and we're just getting more and more material. More, I mean, very up to now, a lot of the attention has been paid to the big monumental buildings, and I think yeah. at the moment we're looking more at these uh, smaller rectangular structures, which uh, we know comparatively little about compared to these uh, bigger buildings. So that's very exciting. Um, mm. So. 
And of course, uh, in the as we saw in the in the um, uh, soundings, I mean, there's so much more to discover that we just didn't know. Um, not only from just new excavations, but also from a reappraisal and reevaluation of what we already have. So mm. there's work there for many generations of archaeologists, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I won't yes. be alive to see the, <laughs> the end of excavations <laughs> of the Wow! Yeah. Wow! But uh, but f- further afield, um, the surrounding area, I and mean, we already know about Karantepe and mm. uh, you know, developments there. Do you expect more? such sites to come to light? I mean, I know there are plenty of other sites around that have been excavated and provide, no. you know, um, contextual information for what was going on in the in the whole uh, area. Um, do, do you think that picture is going to develop uh, a lot more over time? Definitely. I mean, this is really yeah. exciting. I mean, this is something that started yeah. uh, a few years back, um, the excavations at Callahan Tepe. There were numerous T-pillar sites already known from a surface survey. Um, that was a point I was trying to get exactly, to, yeah. I mean, <laughs> from the late 1990s up to, about, you know, to, to the 2010s, there were a number of surface surveys undertaken in the, in the region around uh, Shan Norfa, um, particularly in the, in, the, in the hilly areas uh, surrounding the, um, the Haran Plain. Um, and you know, at least a dozen other sites are known at T-pillar sites. And the most exciting thing is, since uh, two, oh, two years ago, excavations started uh, at Karahan Tepe. Um, mm. And this year, uh, it's branched out further to uh, a number of other T-pillar sites. And, uh, you know, this is really exciting for us um, to be part. Yeah. Gebekli Tepe is now part of a larger project. Um, which is uh, uh, being directed by uh, Professor Nejmi Karol from the University of Istanbul, uh, together with the um, Shannon of a Museum. And of course, we're also involved with the German Archaeological Institute as a cooperation partner um, at Gobekli Tepe. Um, so there's excavations that going on at Karahan Tepe. Um, there are further excavations going on at uh, other sites like uh, Sefer Tepe, Saiborch. I mean, it's just a few to name a few. But mm. at these sites, we're, we're seeing also, uh, you know, buildings, T-pillar buildings, similar symbolism, um, which is exciting for us because at last we have a co- we can actually compare our data to these new the data coming from these new sites. Um, and and uh, for example, I mean one thing I can tell. I mean recently they opened up a, a small um, sort of uh, in in the Shanoofa Museum as a display of, of the first sort of uh, finds from Callahan Tepe. And although it's very similar, it's different. Whereas, for example, yeah. at, at Gobekli Tepe, we have a focus on wild animals. At Karahan Tepe, there seems to be a real focus on the human. Uh, the, uh, oh. form. So, I mean, it seems that these sites may have had different sort of, uh, um, I wouldn't say different understandings or different uh, beliefs or rituals, but I think mm. they probably had a, a different emphasis on different things. Wow. So uh, we'll wait and see. I mean, it's all work in progress. I mean, this is really exciting yeah. for all of us. Wow. Oh, that's brilliant. I, I'm, I'm glad I sort of asked that question. Lee, it's been fantastic. I'm so <coughs> glad that we might made contact uh, with you and mm. were able to e- enable this uh, conversation. Is there anything, you know, that we've, you've, we, we've, we've skipped over that's important to you that you, you'd like to mention before we uh, kind of wrap up? Well, wrap up. I mean, if I can sort of, I don't know, make a sort of concluding remark. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the sort of take-home message would be, you know, Gobekli Tepe is important. However, you know, it's mm. not uh, something that will explain everything. It's not this, like I said, the smoking gun of nutrition. It's a very important site. It is quite rightly a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site for the reasons that I mentioned, the fact that, you know, we have these monumental structures, we have this wonderful um, uh, symbolism there. Um, and this symbolism, I think, is not to do with the new Neolithic way of life. But what we're seeing here, I think, is the pinnacle of a hunter-gatherer tradition. Um, I mentioned uh, that there, we have no evidence at Gobekli Tepe for uh, domesticated animals or plants. Why is that? When at other contemporary sites like Nivali Choi, we do have evidence. I mean, one has to ask, why is that? Um, was it perhaps a taboo? I mean, these are all questions that we're asking ourselves now. Um, mm. You know, was this perhaps a last refuge of some sort of hunter-gatherer tradition where these narratives and myths were being really sort of um, emphasized to keep these traditions going in the face of 
you know, encroaching militarization. I mean, I think this is something we shouldn't actually see this as Gebeti Tepe and its symbolism and its magnificence as something to do with uh, sort of advancing uh, and, and uh, development in the sense of uh, towards from, from hunter, simple hunter-gatherers to more complex um, uh, farmers. But I think it's really a pinnacle of what we're seeing in, in a late Paleolithic hunter-gatherer society. Fantastic. What a fantastic <laughs> roundup, Lee. Thank you so much. Well, That's thank you for the invitation. <laughs> uh, no, really a pleasure. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I would like to say, number one, I hope we can get you back on again uh, to catch up on other things. But number two, uh, Mike and I have got to come over, you know, well, and uh, you know, hopefully do a bit of filming or certainly come visit and, uh, you know, and see the site in flesh because we have not as yet mm -hmm. been, as you know. We must come. So, yeah, there you go. So in the meantime, thank you uh, so much, Lee. And uh, thank you, viewers, for watching and listeners for li listening. Um, we're going to say goodbye to you now, um, but it may interest you to know we're going to chat for a bit, little bit longer with Lee. There are a few supplemental questions that have been asked by our Patreon supporters. So we're going to have a we're, we're going to sneak off now and have a chat about that. In the meantime, if you'd like to listen to what we're going to chat about next, uh, then have a look over at uh, on our Patreon page and see if. Uh, uh, becoming one of our wonderful Patreon community is something that uh, you'd like to do. But in the meantime, thanks for thanks for listening, and watching. Uh, hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't done already. You know it helps. <laughs> and with that, it's a goodbye from me. Yeah, goodbye from me, and it's a. Uh... Oh, well, a goodbye from me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. Super. <laughs> thanks. Folks. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Lee.